Be done with all the people who have put the Bible on such a high shelf that you feel like you can't get to it. There's not one person listening to me right now who isn't in a position to understand the Bible. You can understand it. You can understand it and be blessed by it and be changed by it. Walk, walk in the Word. Walk in the Word. Walk, walk in the Word. This is the way. Last week, I just was so blown away by you guys, so open-hearted, so genuine, so sincere in the way that you received the word about hypocrisy. It was hard to teach that, but our series is called Authentic, Developing the Disciplines of a Sincere Faith, and you can't appreciate the light until you know what it's like to be in the darkness. You've got to see the problem before you can embrace the solution. So we don't want to be hypocritical. We want to be authentic. Now, authentic isn't something you feel first. It's something you do. Do it first, feel it later. We're going to develop the disciplines of a sincere faith, all right? Authentic, developing the disciplines of a sincere faith. We're going to be in Psalm 19, but before we get there, uh, let's just begin and uh, start with a word of prayer, all right? Let's all pray together. Father, thank you for uh, the privilege of calling upon your name. Thank you that in your great wisdom you have made yourself known to us. Grip our hearts afresh with the reality that you have written a book that reveals your heart, your will, your way to us. And thank you, God, that you have made us in such a way uh, that we are nourished by its truth. Thank you, Father, that you have sent your spirit into this world to guide us into this truth. We feel his pursuit when we neglect it. And we sense your spirit's pleasure when we absorb it and, and devour it. So immerse our church afresh in this important discipline, the discipline of your word. And this I pray in the strong and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do you agree? All right, we'll get a Bible then, and uh, let's open our Bibles together to uh, Psalm 19. Now, if you've been coming to Harvest for a while, that you know that normally uh, we are uh, in one passage for the whole message. That's not going to be the case here. I'm going to hear the uh, lovely sound of Bible pages turning. That is my favorite sound in all the world, to see God's people opening God's Word. We're going to turn to some passages, but I want to suggest that you need to do three things in developing the discipline of God's Word. Here's the first one. This is kind of obvious. You need to pick it up, okay? So if you don't have a Bible, uh, share with the person beside you. Reach down to the chair in front of you there. But let's all hold up a Bible. Do you have a Bible in your hand? All right, let's hold that up. Uh, Do you have one? Okay, look at all those Bibles. Isn't that great? Let's hold up the Word of God together. And uh, that's the first thing everyone has to do is you have to actually uh, pick it up, all right? You have to actually pick it up. Uh, The Bible, do you know what you have? Do you know what you're holding? Do you have any sense of that at all? Uh, The Bible actually uh, is beyond any other book. It's not even worthy to be compared. And uh, I I have some specific quotes in this regard. Many could be given if you study any secular literature at all. Uh, George Washington said, It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. John Quincy Adams and other presidents said, So great is my veneration of the Bible that the earlier my children begin to read it, the more confident will be my hope that they will prove useful citizens of their country and respectable members of society. Many other examples could be given. Uh, Charles Dickens said, The New Testament is the very best book that ever will or uh, be known or written in the world. Andrew Jackson said, that book, sir, is the rock upon which our republic rests. Abraham Lincoln said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. Woodrow Wilson, uh, Herbert Hoover, Dwight Eisenhower said, to read the Bible is to take up a trip to a fair land where the spirit is strengthened and faith is renewed. I've been reading recently Decision Points by George Bush, and he has many things to say about the importance of God's word in his life and his thinking. Uh, Great men, great women, great people uh, have found their greatness through being affected by this great book. So the first thing you have to do is pick it up. And while it's exciting to hear what people have to say about the Bible, I don't think there's really any better way to appropriately understand what we've picked up and comprehend what we're holding than to look at uh, what God's Word has to say about itself. So uh, Psalm 119 is the longest statement in all of Scripture about the Bible and its value. 
Uh, many, many, many verses uh, there about that. But a, a good summary of that is in Psalm 19. Uh, let's look at that together, uh, starting in verse 7. Here we have uh, six titles of scripture, six uh, descriptions of scripture, and six results of scripture. All right. Look at the first one, Psalm 19, 7. Uh, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Uh, Jot this first one uh, then down. It transforms us. All right. Uh, Let's pick it up and see what it does for us. Uh, God's word, it transforms us. It transforms me. It transforms uh, you. That's what this statement is saying. Look at it again in your Bible. The law of the Lord. The law is the word there, Torah. uh, Law for life. Rule for living. Uh, God's word is the norm. It is the standard by which every other truth uh, is measured or assessed. And notice it's the law of the Lord. Think about through the centuries how men have laid down their laws, men have laid down their rules, and this is the way society should be governed. This is the way that things should be done. And uh, people come and people go, but the law of the Lord remains. Uh, Notice uh, there also in verse 7, the law of the Lord is, what does it say? Everyone say it. The law of the Lord is, what's it say? The law of the Lord is perfect. Uh, That kind of summarizes it, doesn't it? Uh, That word means literally all-sided, many-faceted, all-encompassing, comprehensive. The law of the Lord is is so perfect, notice that it revives, or one translation says it converts the soul. Now, the soul is the inner part of you. It's the immaterial part of you. You understand that you're not just a physical person. There's a part of you that is spiritual. There's a part of you that will live forever. That's the part of you that needs to be converted, all right? And uh, I'll tell you, I've been so blessed to pastor this church through so many years, and one of the things that blows my mind, I hardly ever reference this, but I see it every weekend. Uh, There's a guy that I have in my mind. When I'm making my message, I think about this guy. I I kind of privately, I hope this doesn't offend you, but I call this guy uh, Joe Screwdriver. That's the guy that comes to harvest. Joe Screwdriver. Regular guy, working his garage, kicking around, trying to make life work. He comes to harvest, and the first week he's like this. But I'll tell you, when weeks become months, and months become seasons, I see God's word transform Joe Screwdriver. First he unbends his arms, then he kind of leans forward. At, At the beginning, he's like... I'm not singing, dude. I'm flat out not singing. You can't make me sing. I'm going to show you I don't like what's happening right now. But we watch the guy. We watch God change the heart of people. Here's how he does it. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. God's word is so powerful. This is what you're holding. Pick it up. God's word is so powerful that it's able to take an unsaved, unregenerated, uninterested, hard-hearted Joe Screwdriver and absolutely turn that guy's life around, put him on his head, raise him up a new person. That's an awesome thing by itself why we would pick up God's word. God's word transforms us. How many people could say that God's word has transformed them? How many people could say, I'm a different person because of the impact God's word has made in my life? Here's the second thing, and how needed this is. God's word gives us wisdom. Notice at the end of verse 7, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Uh, the word here, testimony, uh, is the idea, it pictures God as witnessing to himself. If you want to know what God's like, it's nice to hear from people. But what about God himself taking the witness stand and God saying, this is what I'm like. This is who I am. This is what I will do for you. The testimonies of the Lord is God bearing witness to himself. Now, here's what it says about that. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It's uh, reliable. It's uh, durable. NIV says that it's trustworthy. It's similar, actually, to the verb that's translated amen. Let's all say it. The testimony of the Lord is amen. Say it. The testimony of the Lord is amen. Let's say that together. That's fantastic. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It is amen. It is reliable. And and here's the thing. Well, you're like, well, how um how um how 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 reliable is it exactly? Well, I'd like to answer that question. The testimony of the Lord is so sure that it makes wise 
The simple. See, because the problem with Joe's screwdriver, and we've all been that person, just turn to your neighbor and say, you were that person, all right? We, <laughs> we've all been that person. The problem isn't just that we're stubborn and hard-hearted. The problem is, is that we're simple, we're foolish. The idea of this word uh, simple is actually uh, taken from a word that is, is kind of the idea of openness, to, to, to be open or to be spread out. And the simple person, biblically, is the person who is easily led astray. It's their mind is like a house with the front door open and the back door open. And a thought comes in and the simple person is like, that's amazing. I think that's what I'll spend my life on. And then another thought blows in and they're like, I'm going to be this guy now. And have you seen this latest book from Oprah? And have you seen this latest thought? I just was at Barnes and Nobles and I got this how to fix my life thing. And this simple person can't hang on to what matters. Because they don't have the capacity to feel the weight of what is substantive and feel the absent of what is light and fluffy and foolish. They have no discernment. Now, that's a big problem. And we were all that person. But the testimonies of the Lord are so sure that they can take a foolish, vacillating, undiscerning person and make them wise. My friend Joe, he he used to be, but he's so wise now. The things that he says, the insight that he has, the understanding that, where, where did this come from? We know where it came from. The testimonies of the Lord are sure making wise the simple. Now check this. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's word, it transforms us. It gives us wisdom. Here's the third thing from the beginning of verse 8. It gives us joy, all right? God's word brings joy to our hearts. Notice again, I'm not making these things up, right? They're coming from the Bible, right? Are you looking at your Bible? Okay, I don't sit in my office and go, what should I say about the Bible? No, we're looking into the word to hear what God says himself about this book he's given us. And here he says... The precepts of the Lord are right, okay? Uh, The idea here is is that some translations here have statutes or precepts. It's the idea of divine principles, God's rulings, God's prescriptions and pronouncements, God's charges. Now, the world has a lot of principles. Can you think of some principles that the world has? Anybody? What are some things the world says? The world says um, you only go around once. You know, you got to go for all you can get. Or, or, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, everybody knows, shame on me. Now, there's all these kind of honestly stupidisms that, 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 that cronies revel in uh, that are really such nonsense. And when you put those things up uh, beside uh, God's word, Notice the precepts of the Lord. Well, here, here's the bottom line. Uh, they're right. They're right. Who's right? Who's right? Uh, everyone say God is. Lift up your voice. Say that. Say God is right. right. God is the one who's right. The precepts, there's no discussion anymore. Well, let's have a debate, you know. Is, is uh, the latest atheistic tripe, is that right? Or tell me, who's right? God's right. The, the precepts of the Lord, they're, they're right all the time. That's a pretty phenomenal thing to have in your hands. But, but the best part of this is that they're so right that they rejoice your heart. Really, that's such a, a summary of my life. I was a stupid, foolish, pot-smoking, rebellious teenager And the first thing that changed about me was I gave this book a chance. And it caused my heart to rejoice. It gave me a joy like I had never experienced before, like the disciples when they were walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And the Bible says that Luke 22, that he expounded unto them from the scriptures all the things concerning himself. And when he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread and he left them, this was their comment. They said, did not our hearts burn within us while we walked with him on the road and while he expounded to us from the scriptures all the things concerning himself? 
That's how I got to be in training for ministry and a youth pastor and a seminarian and started this church. All that was going on there was the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. God stirring a joy within me in his word, something I had never really experienced before. It transforms us. It gives us wisdom. It brings us joy. Notice at the end of verse 8, and this is so needed, God's word dispels the darkness. Notice that it says, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Obviously, part of God's word is commands. Are you okay with that? I'm fine with God telling me certain things. I I trust him. And God's like, do this, and you'll, you'll be blessed. Do that, you'll suffer for that. We always say, choose to sin, choose to suffer. Every time God says don't, he means don't hurt himself. I've been saying that so many times, I hear the echo even when I'm not saying it, all right? But those are important truths, all right? That God's word is a commandment, and it's a commandment that is so pure. Actually, I wish that word had been translated there, clear. God, God's, it's clear. It's not uh, cloudy. It's not uncertain. It's obvious. Hey, look up here for a minute. A lot of people uh, have uh, the sense that the Bible is a puzzle, Uh, This Christmas, uh, the family knows that I'm very famous when we're unwrapping presents, that I'll get a little puzzle and I'll get over here in the corner and I'll spend like four hours figuring out this puzzle instead of enjoying the family. And so they're like, there's your box, Dad. Do not open that. And and I I didn't, and we had a great time together. But afterwards, I had to get into these puzzles. But I I haven't solved one of them yet. These little things all knotted up and you you can't quite... I'll bring one and show you. They're crazy. Maybe you can help me. (laughs) The Bible's not like that. All right? Just turn to your neighbor and say it's not like that. All right? The Bible's not like that. It's clear. All right? You can understand it. It yields its message to the normal. Uh, you don't pick up a magazine and go, I don't think I'm going to be able to figure this out. Be done with all the people who have put the Bible on such a high shelf that you feel like you can't get to it. There's not one person listening to me right now on any of our campuses uh, who, who isn't in a position to understand the Bible. You can understand it. You can understand it and be blessed by it and be changed by it. The commandment of the Lord is, let's say, clear, enlightening the eyes. How many here could stand and give testimony if we set up microphones and say, I used to see it like this, but now I see it like this. I used to think about marriage this way, but then God's word, and now my eyes have been enlightened. I used to think about parenting like this. I had all my thoughts about spanking and discipline and and loving your kids. I had all these thoughts about it, but then God's word, it's so clear, the commands of the Lord. They enlightened my eyes. Absolutely. It dispels the darkness. All right. Let's summarize where we've been and get two more things here. What a great passage. The law of the Lord is so comprehensive that it is able to totally transform the inner man. It transforms us. Number two, the testimony, God's testimony about himself is so reliable that it can take a vacillating simpleton and make them skilled in daily living. God's word gives us wisdom. God's divine principles set a right path through the maze of life so that it can cause our hearts to experience joy. It brings us joy. And the commands of the Lord are so crystal clear that they bring light to the darkness in every human heart. How many people here even this week, this month, you have had such darkness in you, you've laid awake, you've tossed and turned, you've puzzled and fretted and, and worried and, and paced about confusion, perplexity, fear, something up ahead, it's coming, I don't know what it is. And, and God's word is the light that he's given to dispel that darkness in you. Do you pick it up? Do you, do you know what you're holding? Do you understand the resource that's at your fingertips before you can ever rightly utilize God's word? You have to pick it up. Two more things here from Psalm 19 uh, quickly. And notice now we're in verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is clean. The fear, of course, we've talked about this many times. The fear of God is just that. It's the fear of God. Don't let anybody tell you about it. It's respect for God. Well, it becomes respect, but it starts off as fear. 
He said, well, James, are you afraid of God? Yeah, yeah, at the base I am. In my foundation, I'm afraid that if I make the wrong decision, I know I'll experience the consequences. God is not mocked. I will sow what I reap. You will too. And I'm fearful of being on the wrong side of God. So the fear of the Lord is the attitude of heart that seeks to be in a right relationship with the fear source. And here, God's word is being called the fear of the Lord. It's the understanding of who God is. Do you remember the two thieves on the crosses with Jesus? One said, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today I'll be with you in paradise. And the other guy was like, <laughs> it's hard to believe. But there he is. And the son of God's being crucified right beside him. And he says, if you're really God, you know, um, why don't you get us down off these crosses? And the one thief was so offended by the other one, he yells around and says to him, don't you even fear God? We're here because of what we did. But this man has done nothing. See, he had a sense of who God was and who he was, and he wanted to be in a right relationship with him. That's the fear of the Lord. And notice that the text says that the fear of the Lord is clean, without blemish, undiminished, consistently uncompromised, without dilution or defilement. It's full strength, you know? It's not, everyone say, it's not watered down. Say that. It's not watered down. It's it's clean, it's pure, it's undiluted. And notice that the result is, is that it endures forever. It's a source of stability when circumstances shake our world. It endures forever. In every place, in every generation, in every century, in every millennium, this book has been a source of stability to all who turn to it. And it can be that for you. It adds stability and then lastly, this so resonates with my heart, it promises justice. Notice here in the text, it says, the rules of the Lord are true and altogether righteous. The rules, that means really the rulings. One translation says the judgments of the Lord. God's verdicts, his pronouncements, his consequences, his uh, decisive actions Man acts, and then God acts. Man chooses wrong, God administers consequence and ultimately judgment. Man turns from that and repents and believes, and God administers grace. These are the judgments of the Lord. Do A, get this result, always. Do B, get this result, always, all right? And so the point here is, is that God's word, it transforms you, it gives you wisdom, it brings you joy, it dispels the darkness, it adds stability, and it promises justice. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I find uh, hardest to manage is that I have in my heart a longing for justice. If I see something that's wrong, I want to make it right. If I see something, somebody do something they shouldn't do, I, I feel in my heart, make that right, God. If I read the paper or watch the news and I see that this rape or this murder or this awful kidnapping or this, this I was reading uh, this morning about uh, an abortion doctor who had through years since 1993 been a known murderer of babies, eighth month, nine month, you would birth them live and then murder them. I want that fixed. I want that fixed. And if you know what it is to have a longing in your heart for justice, you, you need to understand that God's word is those pronouncements. What God thinks about everything that happens, what God will do about everything that happens, this is the word of God. The judgments of the Lord are true. See, because part of the problem is, is that we all know that criminal X, uh, bad person Y, if they go to court, I mean, how many people would agree? Hold up your hand if you agree that he probably won't get what he deserves. Probably is not going to get that. But see, that's not the final court of appeal, all right? In the end, God will balance the books of justice, and this is the declaration of his intent. That should comfort our hearts. We should leave these matters of vengeance with the Lord. All right, all that to say this, pick it up. Pick it up. Oh, that I could be uh, God's Holy Spirit to you and that you would pick up this book. Now, let's just talk. We've surveyed 100 people and the uh, top four answers are on the board to this question. Name a reason uh, that people give for not picking up the Bible. 
Okay, because I didn't just start thinking about this yesterday. You know that, right? So we kind of have a feeling why, why some of you sometimes, why some of us sometimes don't pick up the Bible. I, I love this graphic. Very nice. Family feud. Say hello. Uh, uh, number four answer is ding. Okay. Uh, people say it's not interesting. Now, that's clearly a statement from someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. All right? Yeah, and uh, how many times have you uh, been in the Bible again? Well, one time I read it in fourth grade. Yeah, you need to give that another look, okay? You're not the person you were then. Uh, God's, w- when your heart's right, when your heart's ready, God's word is gripping. Uh, number three answer, reason we don't read the Bible, I forget. I think that's a little more legit. Uh, I get up, I get busy. How many people have intended to get into the word and got onto their computer instead in the last month okay how many people have intended to get into god's word but instead got into their cup of coffee and some little detail that had to be taken care of around the house put up your hand if you've done that how many people have intended to get into god's word but instead they got on their phone and found out they got a text message from someone and before they knew it it was noon and they didn't do it put up your hand if you've done that all right so uh, we all understand that intent doesn't always become reality and reasons people give for not getting into God's word, I forget, I get off track. Number two answer, uh, I don't understand it. Well, it's hard for me to remember what that was like, but I just want to say that I think that that's legitimate. I think people genuinely feel that way, and I'm going to address that a little bit later in the message. And then lastly, reasons people give, number one answer, too busy. Uh, okay, uh, not great. Uh, not great. If you're, we're, we all agree, we're not too busy to do the things uh, that really matter. So if we're too busy to get into God's word, uh, then clearly we are what? Say it. If we're too busy to get into God's word, then we're what? We're too, correct. Turn to your neighbor and say that. Say you're too, yeah, you are. We all are. We're too busy if we're too busy to get into God's word. But we're going to try to conquer some of these obstacles. Here's the second part of it. You have to pick it up. And uh, secondly, you have to uh, size it up. Okay? you got to actually know what you're holding in your hands to be able to appreciate it. And in order to help you do that, we're going to do something we don't normally do here. We're going to turn to some Bible passages, all right? So let's make that great sound and let's uh, turn all of us, can we, uh, in our Bibles. Look this verse up first of all. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14. Jeremiah 5, uh, 14 uh, says uh, this. Behold, I am making my words in your mouth a fire, and this people wood, and the fire shall consume them. Now, other passages could be given, but this is the statement that God's word is a fire. It's the idea that God's word is hot, it is aggressive, it is purifying, it is not to be trifled, trifled with. It consumes all of the obstacles in its path. It takes away the dross and what is useless. I can't tell you how often I have got into God's word with my mind in a muddle. Straw and cobwebs and dust. And God's word vaporizes the nonsense in my thinking and gets me on subject. And that's the idea of God's word like a fire. That's, it's a fire. Everyone say it. Say it's a fire. Now here's the second thing. I turn into the New Testament. Uh, toward the end of the New Testament is the book of Hebrews. And several years ago, we went through this uh, verse by verse and taught on this exact passage. But Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 12, uh, says this. Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, uh, sharper than any... There it is. Do you see it? God's word is a sword. God's word is a sword. Uh, As kids, uh, it's funny, we used to do these sword drills. You ever do these in church? You had to hold up your Bible and you had to hold it by the spine and and you had to, okay, um, and then you had to give the reference. All right, John 3, 16, everyone charge. And we practiced opening and finding verse in our Bible. The first kid would stand up, you know, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And you'd get some little award. I can remember my mom having us do that so often in Bible club and teaching kids. But here's, here's the point. Not sword drills. But the Bible is something, Hebrews 4 says, that it is uh, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating or dividing 
the joints and marrow, getting right to the heart of the matter, getting to the, how often do we discuss things in our home or in the marketplace or in our small group? And we're off in tangents and alleys and off on the side. The word of God gets to the heart of the matter. And that's a wonderful gift that God's given to us. It's a fire, it's a sword. Um, Back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a wonderful spokesman for God and much of what he said is about God's word. In Jeremiah 23, I'm turning to it just like you are. Jeremiah 23, just to the right of the center of your Bible begin the major prophets, Isaiah and then Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29 God says this through Jeremiah about his own word. He says, Is not my word like fire? We've seen that already, declares the Lord. But here's another thing. And like a, here it is, a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. God's word is like a, (laughs) like a hammer. How many people experience God's word like a hammer? And I was so stubborn. I, I remember a youth speaker coming to our church. It was maybe just a year after I had really given my life back to the Lord. And I had, one of the things that had happened when I recommitted to the Lord was I lost one of my best friends. He just wasn't where I was and he wanted to stay where we had been. I'll never forget this youth evangelist standing up. I was sitting over in this section here and he was up in the balcony, this friend of mine. And how shocked I was that as the word went out and thinking about him, his name was Dan, and praying for him And then seeing Dan come right down the aisle and right down to the front and kneel at the front. And afterwards, when I talked to him, I didn't even know of this verse then, but afterwards when I talked to him, Dan said, he broke a hard rock tonight. And he had seen the stubbornness in his own heart. And maybe you're here listening right now or you're on one of our campuses and and your heart has become hard. Maybe your heart has become resistant. Now, Now, look at Give God's word a chance, okay? If you say, but I'm so stubborn, I'm so stubborn. Open God's word. It is the hammer that will break the rock in pieces. All right? Are you ready for that? Are you ready to let God's word do its work in your life? Pick it up. Size it up. It's fire. It's a sword. It's a hammer. Let's turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says this. 1 Peter 1, 23. Are you there? Everyone turning? Mark these in your Bible. He says, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. Now, Jesus told parables about the Word of God being a seed. And here, Peter, who heard Jesus' teaching, is is repeating that message under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the Word of God is a seed. Now, when we say the word of God is a seed, what we say is, and this is why we're sizing it up right now, you look at this little book, and yet this truth has satisfied the greatest minds in human history, that we're not even capable of framing questions that the Bible doesn't answer. It is so far beyond us. The greatest student of scripture in our church has not begun to plumb the depths of what's in God's word. It can satisfy uh, the greatest minds for a lifetime and beyond. All right? And so that's why it's called a seed. It, it appears small, but we all know the power of a little seed and what it has the potential to become and how it can multiply and grow and spread. It's a wonderful picture God's given to us in his word. It's a seed. It starts small. It needs good soil. It takes time, but it produces great food. It's seed. And here's another thing also in First Peter. Just look across the page. To 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it's milk. It's milk. Have I mentioned, I don't, I've been meaning to mention in church, have I mentioned that we have grandkids now? Has that, has that come up in a service? I'm not sure if I, I decided not to bring pictures today. But have I, have I brought pictures before? I, uh, I'm obviously pretty uh, fired up about these grandkids. And uh, I had forgotten that not for days, not for weeks, but for months... These kids eat nothing but, tell me, ladies, nothing but. Really? Nothing but milk? I keep saying to Abby, when are you going to give that kid some food? Not yet, Dad, not yet. Man, give the kid some food, man. Not yet, not just milk, milk, milk. That's all they need. And here the Word of God says that we're to be like that in regard to the Scriptures. As newborn babes, 
How many, what was it, almost a thousand adults baptized in our church last year? If you're a babe in Christ, if you're a young believer, like a baby needs milk, you need the word of God. You need it so desperately. You ought to wake up and cry for the word of God. Not once a day, but several times a day. And, and you ought to be calling out for it, desiring it, longing for it, looking for it. Just like a baby's body needs milk, so a new Christian's soul needs the Word of God. We're sizing it up. This is really quite something that God's... We're, it's like we're walking around it and we're looking at it and we're asking the question, what, what, I picked it up, now I'm sizing it up. What, what is it exactly that God has given to me here? It's a fire, it's a sword, it's a hammer, it's a seed, it's milk. Back a couple of pages from... Peter, back into Hebrews again. Chapter 4 said that it was a sword. Chapter 5, verse 12, tells us that God's word is not just milk, it's meat. It's meat. Hebrews 5, 12 says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The basic oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food or, or meat. For everyone who lives on milk, see, For some of you, you've never graduated to the solid food, the meat of God's word. And when I think of meat, I'm not thinking about something like this. God's word's not like that, not raw and unprepared. God's word's like that, all right? And I haven't been having as much of that lately. I don't know if you've noticed that. But um, we all understand that that is very attractive to us. And, and this is, this, God's word is like that. It is satisfying. It is nourishing. And I grieve for Christians who have been living on milk like our little grandbabies but they're school age but they're in junior high but they're in high school chronologically but they're still eating the diet of a baby some of you need to arrest your health spiritually by digging more deeply into God's word It's not just milk, it's meat. And two more things quickly from Psalm 119 that I mentioned earlier in the message, the most comprehensive statement about the value of God's word in all of God's word. Psalm 119 is 176 verses, each one making a value statement about scripture. But Psalm 119, 105 says, my grandmother taught me this verse. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Your word is a light to my path and how many people here are standing over milk that's been spilt plans that went south bad decisions that were made and why were those bad decisions made because you made them in the darkness you didn't consult God's word you didn't get the counsel of the Lord through the Lord's people through the word of God and you made a bad decision and and you experience the consequences God's word is a lamp to our feet that means it shows us the next step it's, it's a, like a little lamp. I'm walking in the dark, and God's word is, is this light to my feet. All right, it's a lamp to my feet, but it's a light to my path. Not just the next step, but where am I going with my life? What is my life to be all about? Where am I heading? Where will I end up? What matters the most? God's word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. No more stumbling, no more wandering and walking down dead ends and getting ripped off. It's a light And then I've experienced this last one so frequently. A fire, a sword, a hammer, a seed, a milk, it's meat, it's light. It's a mirror. God's word is a mirror. This comes from the book of James. Last scripture. Don't be tired. Turn there, please. Make that sound. I'm listening. Make the lovely sound of the pages turning. I love to hear that knowing that you're digging into the scriptures for yourself. James chapter 1 verse 23 It tells us this about the Bible. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. If you only come to church and hear what the word says, you're like a person who looks at a mirror and goes, I have, you just come and you kind of like, you know, I have some, uh, I have some, uh, I have some mustard on my face. I should probably take that off. And I will tomorrow, okay? That's a foolish person. That's a hearer of the word. 
The person who allows God's word to be truly a mirror is a person who allows God's word to reveal who they really are, and then they act upon uh, what it says. Notice here again from James uh, chapter 1. For he who looks at himself and goes away and once for, at once forgets what he was, but the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. One of my prayers for the message this weekend is, is that God's word would be convicting you about the neglect of God's word in your life. So you pick it up, you size it up. Now here's the last thing. You eat it up, Okay. You've got to eat it. It's not enough to hold it. I carry my Bible everywhere I go. I have one in my purse. I have one in my glove compartment. It's not enough to even size it up. I respect it. I revere the Word of God. I, I, I value the Word of God. You have to eat it up. You have to imbibe it yourself. I have quoted many times here at Harvest my uh, life verse, which is Jeremiah uh, 15, uh, 16, which says, Your words were found to me. A 19-year-old, stubborn, rebellious student. But your words were found to me, and I did eat them. And they became in me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I long for every person here to have that experience. I long for every person listening in Niles and in Crystal Lake and in Elgin and, and in Chicago North and in our, this great new campus in Aurora celebrating today. I long for us to be a people, a church family that, that devours the word of God for itself. Let me just give you some quick things as I close on how you can do that. First of all, this is fairly straightforward, but read it. Read it. Read the Bible. The Bible's uh, a lot like a textbook in the sense that you've got to start in the right places, but unlike a textbook, it doesn't have the easiest stuff at the beginning of the book and the hardest stuff at the end of the book, okay? There's there's a lot in the Bible that is two plus two equals four, and there's a lot in the Bible that's algebra, all right? Algebra's no problem, but you've got to brush up on two plus two equals four before you can get to algebra, okay? So let me tell you where the simple equations in the Bible are. For sure, remember this, John. First John, the Gospel of John. Those are easily understood, available to anyone passages of Scripture. Don't, don't like jump into Ecclesiastes. You're going to be like, what? What? All right? Don't like drop into Song of Solomon. All right? You can get there. You can for sure get there. That's available to everyone too. Okay? But start with something understandable. I'm in the Gospel of John again this year. I'm in the Gospel of John right now. Why don't we do that together? Why don't we read it? And I would suggest this a chapter a day. Not three verses, not 300 verses. I know a lot of people like to read through the Bible in a year, but I'm trying to get more people on board the Bible train here, okay? So a chapter a day. No guilt about anything other than just a chapter a day. Open with a brief word of prayer. I sit in a chair. I lean forward. I don't read the Bible laying down. I don't know about you, but when I lay down, I, you know, I pass out. So I sit up and I lean forward and I put my Bible on my desk and I have a pen in my hand and a journal and a place to write things because that's the second thing you want to do. Read it, jot this down, question it. All right? You got to question the Bible and just, just, what do you mean, man? I don't mean like object to it. I mean, uh, jot these questions down. Is there an example for me to follow? Every time you read the Bible, you say, is there an example for me to follow? Is Jesus doing something I should be doing? Is, is Herod doing something I shouldn't be doing? It could be a positive or a negative example. That's a really important question in the Bible. Ask yourself, is there an example for me to follow? Secondly, is there a sin for me to confess? Is there something here that I need to acknowledge or confess? Like, Lord, I'm like that. I, I, I'm, I'm wrong, God. And just right there, confess that to him. Is there a truth for me to um, understand? Sometimes God just wants to expand our thinking. I didn't know that about God. I didn't know that he was like that. He's so tender. He's so loving. He's so forgiving. He's so insistent. He's so pursuing. He's so truthful. Is, the, is there a truth for me to embrace? or to understand would be better. An example to follow, a sin to confess, a truth to understand, and then lastly, I have found this to be true, is there a comfort for me to embrace? 
is God's word assuring me about something. I, I can be anxious, I can be fearful, I can be uncertain, I can be vacillating. Is there, is there a, a strength here, a comfort? Is there something that I can, all right, I think you get that. I hope you're gonna be doing that this week. Read it, question it. But if you really wanna get to where the Bible takes you, you gotta go to this next level and most people do not. A plan it, read it, question it, plan it. Make a plan of action. If God's word says something about uh, anger stirs up strife. A week ago, I, I had to acknowledge to a couple of my staff members, I, I was angry with you and I'm sorry for that. Please forgive me. That, and I've written that in my own time with the Lord. I'm gonna deal with that because when God's word convicts you, you have to make a plan to do something about that. Not just to agree with it, but then plan it. Make a, okay, so uh, let's say these together. Number one, what? Read it. Number two, what? Question, Question it. Number three, a plan it. Make a plan of action, a goal, a time. I'm going to take some action in this regard. Um, and then this has always really helped me. Pray it. And I always have my prayer time. We're going to talk about that next uh, Lord's Day weekend. But for now, um, I pray that part of my first part of my prayer time after worship is thank you, Lord, for speaking to me from your word today. Thank you, Lord, for challenging me about this. I agree with your word when it says, and pray that out to the Lord, all right? And then... Uh, uh, share it. I don't do this every day, but I'll frequently say, Kathy, I got this out of your, out of your uh, the word today, or, or, or Tony, or Landon, I, I got this out of the word today, and this is, this is what I've been studying, this is what it, it's meant to me, and I'll just take someone aside and say, Andy, Andy, look what I got out of God's word today, and this is what this meant to me, what do you think about this, or isn't this a great verse, and I'll tell you, not just with your small group, but just with people who come and, I found this in the Bible, isn't this incredible? And, and I, I'll tell you what, I've been doing that for over 30 years, and I'm never lacking for content. It's always alive and fresh. So read it, question it, plan it, pray it, share it. With me? Let's use God's word to stir one another up to love and good works. All right, I'm almost done. Um, now we're going to practice. We're going to practice it, okay? So everybody just turn over to this last passage, and I'm done. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Now here's a passage of scripture that everyone can understand. Read it, question it, plan it, pray it, share it. Let the peace of Christ, boy, the peace of Christ. Do I have the peace of Christ? Boy, I don't, I don't know if I really have that. I, I definitely should, uh, I'm asking myself a question about that. Is there an example there for me to follow? Is there a sin, anxiety, the opposite of peace for me to confess? And, and, you know, I, I'm gonna, I need to have more of the peace of Christ in my ruling, like being in charge, ruling over my heart. Sometimes my heart's like a tornado and my friends are like a fan. I, 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 I need the peace of God to rule in my heart, not other people, not circumstances. He, I need Jesus to speak peace to my heart. And I need to be thankful Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. I need to be thankful. I need to let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. How many here are wealthy in a human sense, wealthy in a relational sense, but you're impoverished, you're poor, you're penniless in regard to God's word? I'm going to let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. And I'm going to share it. I'm going to teach and admonish. I think you get the point. We've been talking about God's word for a long time. I couldn't be more excited about it. Will you get into God's word this week? Will you dig into it afresh? I am not an authentic Christian unless I am authentically, regularly connected to the word of God. But I have that sense of authenticity when I develop the discipline of God's word. Let's be authentic. Let's develop the disciplines of a sincere faith. All right? Why don't we all stand together? for a word of prayer. Let's all pray. Father, thank you for this great privilege that you've given us to call upon your name, to dig into your word, and we would just confess in this moment, Lord, too often we have neglected the word of God. Too often we have fattened our souls on things that don't satisfy. And the hunger that we feel the, the aching inside is a hunger that you've placed there by your spirit for your word. Help us, God, to pick it up. 
pursue us by your spirit this week every morning when we wake up stir it within us God pick this book up size up its value eat it up feed us God feed us on your word and help us as we develop these disciplines of a sincere faith we want to be authentic God we don't want to look the part we want a real growing dynamic personal relationship with you meet us as we meet you in your word this week I pray in Jesus precious name Amen To the left, to the right, oh I will not go To the left, to the right, oh Walk in the Word, our mission is to ignite passion in the people of God through the proclamation of truth. And you can find more biblical teaching on this topic as well as many other resources on our website, walkintheword.com. There you can request a complete catalog or order online. Or if you'd like to call us, our toll-free number is 888-581-WORD. That's 888-581-9673. And by the way, you can call 24 hours a day. If you'd like to write us, our website has the U.S. and Canadian address information. And that website again is walkintheword.com. Thanks for listening to God's truth taught here on Walk in the Word. Our prayer for you is that you will continue to grow in Christ as you walk in the Word. This is the way